So I want you to think back to when <laughs> earlier this week we introduced this idea of integration and it's this big new category. In fact, we're going to sort of spend the next, well not quite 12 months, 9 months wrapping our heads how, around how we're going to use this object. But being that we've, like, we've just introduced it, we're like, okay, it's a new thing, you know what derivatives are? And now we know what integrals are. There's going to be a whole lot of thinking that we're going to have to just try and understand what are these objects, how do they behave? Um, the way that I would compare this to is, does anyone know what the Large Hadron Collider is? Has anyone heard of that object before? Get a show of hands, because I saw some nodding, but not much. Yeah, very small number. Okay, hands down. So the Large Hadron Collider is this huge structure. It costs billions, I don't know, trillions of dollars to create. It's in Europe. It's underground. It's this big circular, correct me if I'm wrong, people who actually know, um, roughly circular track where they take two protons and they use magnets, I think it is, like really big magnets, to accelerate these protons to like 99.9999999999, I think it is, percent the speed of light. So they go really, really fast and then they collide. And when they collide, they break apart into all of these little pieces. And earlier, oh, how long ago was it? When we were doing this, they're basically simulating what happens at the Big Bang, or well, what happened at the Big Bang, that collision, that incredible energy. And they discovered a new particle, it's called the Higgs boson. And it's kind of analogous to what we did here, we discovered this new object, this integral, and we want to understand, well, now that we know this thing exists, what can it do, right? So I'm going to talk you through a bunch of properties. You will find pretty much all of these in your textbook, but when I look at them, when I first learned them, I kind of found them to be algebraic soup. So I've kind of given a name to every single one of these, and the name is not there to be like, oh, another thing to remember. I hope it just helps you understand what these things mean, okay? So the first name, the first property, is called sign. And we've introduced this one before, so I'm going to write it in algebraic form so that you can um, see the idea that we expressed earlier. The simple idea is that the integral from a to b of f with respect to x. You remember what we're doing here, we're adding up rectangles with this height and this width. Okay. Earlier we said it's just area. It's just the area under the curve, it's the area bounded here and there. But then we learned when we tried to integrate something like this, we learned that the idea of area covered by an integral is a little more nuanced, right? In fact, do you remember what was the area, the integral rather, that we calculated when we did this one? We found it to be zero, which was sort of weird because it looks like it's bigger than zero. But the issue is that you've got not only an area above the x-axis, you also have an area beneath the x-axis. And integrals treat them differently. So to distinguish between this idea, we say it's more than just area. We call it a signed area. OK, it's a signed area. So what this means is that I can have such a thing as negative areas. It doesn't make sense just in the context of measurement, but in the context of integration, it has to be. How do you work out what the signed area is? Well, there are two parts. There are parts above and there are parts below. Right? So what we do is we say you add the areas above the x-axis. Those are all positive. That's fine. And then you subtract all the areas that are below the x-axis. That's it. Now, you can see here, for example, if you look back at our example over here, right? This area down here, if we think about that in classical terms, it's just like do, do your base, do your height, and you'll find out some value. But when it comes to an integral, we have to regard that as negative, right? So since that's negative, that's why we actually subtract it. Right? Um, that means there's a double negative in there, so just watch out. Now, <clears throat> sometimes you'll see, uh, instead of saying areas above and areas below, you'll see absolute value signs appear in here. Some textbooks use that. Um, you might hear that from tutoring or something like that. That's fine, it's correct, but I try to avoid using absolute value signs because often students use it in place of understanding what is going on. They just say, I don't know, area is supposed to be positive, so just pop absolute value signs around it. Um, often you get the right number at the end, but you don't know why it is what it is. So it's because of this idea of signed area that you can have areas above, areas below, you treat them differently. Okay. All right, the next property is actually kind of a double-barreled property and it has to do with symmetry. 
Okay. So what I want to think about is when you integrate and your boundaries, your upper and lower boundaries are symmetrical. Okay. Eric, where have you been? Yeah. Hurry up, take a seat. You're like super late. And you've missed all this legwork. I'm going to make you carry things outside just for the sake of doing what everyone else did. If you have an integral and its boundaries are not just some random A to B, whatever, right? If they are on opposite sides of the x axis, so for example, from negative 3 to 3, from negative 100 to 100, so you have symmetrical boundaries, okay? I can work out easily what the area will be if the function itself also has some kind of symmetry to it. Okay, so let me say that again. If you have symmetrical boundaries, and if your function that you're integrating also has some kind of symmetry, then depending on the kind of symmetry it has, you end up with something very simple. Okay? So for instance, let's consider if it was an odd function. If it was an odd function, you're going to have a situation somewhat like this. Right? In fact, this is the kind of situation you might have. So I've just turned that line into an odd function. Okay, what does it mean to be an odd function? It's got what kind of symmetry? When you, yeah, when you rotate, when you rotate, or you could say across the line y equals x, right? So because you've got an odd function, this positive area over here has to be exactly the same as the negative area. Does that make sense? But positive and negative, what are they going to equal to? Zero. So if you have an odd function, then if you do symmetrical boundaries, you just get zero. The parts on the left-hand side and the parts on the right-hand side, they just cancel. Okay. On the other hand, though, if you have an even function, okay, so let's just draw a little quick diagram underneath here, or maybe beside, we've got some space here. Give me an even function, any even function. Y equals x squared is the classic example of an even function. Okay? So if we have some kind of symmetrical boundaries here, let's put uh, A over here, so there's part of an area. That would mean negative A is on the opposite side, like this. Okay, now what I'm looking for is a shortcut. A shortcut that takes advantage of the symmetry that's kind of built into this and the symmetry that we put into our boundaries. So what might be a nice easy way that we could evaluate this area? Have a look at it. What kind of symmetry does this have again? It's not rotational symmetry, it's, it's reflectional symmetry, right? Which means that this shape over here should be exactly the same as this one over here. Does, does that make sense? So I don't have to work this out twice. I can just work out one of them and then say, well, you've got two of those same areas, right? So I'm going to say there's two lots of, now it's a new integral. It's a new integral. What is one of these? For example, see this one over here. What integral would express that area just on the right-hand side? How would you state it? The integral from, where do we start? Zero. Zero. You end at a, it's still the same any point, and it's still the same function. Now, you might think, well, it's a bit funny. Like, it's an integral over here, and it's an integral over here. What was the point? What was the advantage? Well, you tell me. Have a think about this. Think about what you know about the process of integration. Uh, this is a good example because unlike, say, that one over there, which you could have just worked out with like the area of a triangle, there's no, there's no formula for the area of whatever, whatever on earth that shape is called. Right? So you know you've got two ways to evaluate an integral. One's the area formula. What's the other way? What's the other? You're going to use the start with the P. Think, think, think. You're going to use the primitive function, right? You're going to say, well, if that's F, I will find the primitive of F, F prime, capital F, right? And then I'll evaluate it at this boundary and this boundary. Can you see why I would like to have zero? Like when we're testing out stationary points, you're like, try zero when you're doing polynomials. Try zero, because it's easy to deal with, right? So that's why I like putting in zero. I like that uh, boundary better than these boundaries. Does that make sense? 